This week, one thing and one thing alone happened. For two months, I've been covering the siege of Chattanooga. It has seen heroes fall, leaders rise, and the convergence of two years of fighting, all leading up to this, the Battle of Chattanooga, where Grant will clash with Bragg for the fate of the West. Before moving forward, let us get a good look at both armies, and let us start with Major General Ulysses S. Grant. He has the military division of the Mississippi, with all but General Burnside present. The division present at Chattanooga has three parts, the Army of the Tennessee, the Army of the Potomac's Detachment, and the Army of the Cumberland. First off is the Army of the Tennessee, under trusted ally of Grant, General William T. Sherman. It has one full corps and a half corps. The full corps is the 15th corps under General Francis P. Blair, which has an impressive four divisions, while the part of the 17th Corps brought was one division under Bird General John E. Smith. Then there's General Joseph Hooker's command, which is in total three divisions, two belonging to the 11th Corps under Major General Oliver Howard and a single one of the 12th Corps under Bird General John W. Gary. That leaves only Major General George H. Thomas's Army of the Cumberland, which brings two corps to the battle. Major General Guard and Grangers, 4th Corps, and the 14th Corps under Major General John Palmer. In addition, it brings a cavalry division and a separate artillery wing. In total, Grant has around 75,000 men. Then there is General Braxton Bragg's Army of Tennessee. It started out around parity of the military division it now faces, but after attaching Longstreet to Knoxville, Bragg has brought his force down to around 55,000, sorted nicely into two corps. Well, kind of. The first corps under Lieutenant General William J. Hardy, and the second corps under Major General John C. Breckinridge. There is also the Cavalry Corps under Major General Joseph Wheeler. With that out of the way, we get to the action. Grant has tasked Major General Thomas and Major General Baldy Smith to give him a plan that would utilize Sherman. What they gave him is actually pretty simple. Hold the rebels in place and have Sherman attack their right flank and roll them up. Not elegant, but better than nothing, which is what Bragg had planned. The plan was delayed as Sherman took his damn time to arrive. Forces are shifted around as Grant tries to stealthily readjust his line, screening the movement of the 11th Corps behind hills. When Sherman arrived on the 16th, he was still without a majority of his force. But just as Grant had to delay before, he now has to speed up. On the 20th, Grant gets two messages, one from Bragg, which is bizarre, and one from Burnside. As there may still be non-combatants in Chattanooga, I deem it proper to notify you that Putin's would dictate the early withdrawal. This message is hogwash. It clearly implies an assault from Bragg. But Grant knows that Bragg hasn't assaulted for months, and he isn't going to start now. But he also receives word that General Ambrose Burnside is under assault at Knoxville. Longstreet cuts the telegraph lines, leaving Grant in the dark of how Burnside is holding out. Grant wants to assault now, but he has to wait for Sherman's force. And just as more divisions of the Army of the Tennessee came in, a crash of thunder, a downpour of rain, Grant has to move quickly to save Burnside, but he can't because of the weather. This reassures Bragg of the safety of his position. Now is the time to strengthen Longstreet. He gives the order on the 22nd to General Simon Buckner and General Patrick Claiborne to take their divisions and leave the line. He can rest easy. For heaven's sake, he controls the high ground and is coming off the brack of victory. Plus, his opponent is still missing one-third of its army. But Bragg was wrong. For when the final seconds of the 22nd passed to the first ones of the 23rd, the day of siege turned to the day of battle. Grant's camp has two interesting visitors on the night of the 22nd, two rebel deserters who upon interrogation mentioned the removal of the two divisional commanders, then the bombshell. Bragg might be retreating. While this could be welcome news, Grant will not allow it. He has the man outnumbered. He knows his army can win. I fear that this is another Gettysburg in the making. Grant re-examined his plan with renewed urgency. He needs to ensure that the rebels at Missionary Ridge are held in place so that Sherman's opponents don't receive reinforcements. More pressure must be applied. This gave Grant two major obstacles, the four positions of the Confederates and those at Wilkett Mountain. These two obstacles are given to General Thomas and General Hooker. We'd also like to mention that General Hooker is placed under Thomas's command right about now. Thomas and Grant look at this problem of the forward position that rests upon a hill line. 
whose center hill is Orchard Knob. Orchard Knob is opposite Fort Wood, the jumping off point for Thomas, and is lightly guarded, but still possesses a threat. It's a forward line. And Grant wants Thomas, when the time comes, to assault, well, really just apply pressure, to Missionary Ridge to apply pressure to Bragg. Orchard Knob would be a speed bump in that assault, but if taken, would shorten the distance needed in that eventual assault. Grant doesn't want a Fredericksburg or Chickasaw Bayou. Orchard Knob must be taken now. Where is Thomas do a reconnaissance on the 23rd and to take it on the 24th? Thomas has to accomplish this four divisions, two from the 4th Corps and two from the 14th, numbering in total 33,000 men. These men are fully fed, freshly equipped, and armored in new uniforms. They will be supported by 22 cannons from Fort Wood, and if need be, the 11th Corps is ready to reinforce. Orchard Knob has 600 men at the rifle pits and 1,200 men ready to reinforce them. As Mike Lardass put it, Grant was using a sledgehammer to crack a walnut. Though there is a threat of Confederate artillery at Missionary Ridge, which covered the knob, Thomas arranges the two divisions of the 4th Corps in parade formation in front of Fort Wood, these divisions being the second and third ones under Bernardino, Sheridan, and Wood, respectively. The men hold the rifles tightly, allowing for the light to reflect off their metal barrels to impress the Confederate observers behind their binoculars. The Confederate observers took it for nothing more than a parade. Two months of nothing has passed. Why should a Queen's rifle mean anything now? Just as an observer goes to take a seat and rest, he hears a cannon boom. 1330 hours, Wood orders his men to advance at the double quick. Sheridan soon replicates the order. The rebels rush to their arms, but before they can alert the cannons at Missionary Ridge, the Union was already in their rifle pits. When the battle actually came, it was 14,000 Union soldiers against 634 rebels, though each side was soon reinforced. The first brigade to reach the knob was under the Prussian General August Willich, who was able to plant the flag without much resistance, soon followed by the second brigade of Wood's division under the command of General Hazen, thus to deal with the brunt of the rebels. The rebels are General Manigault's 24th and 28th Alabama, who are stubborn, but the 20th Alabama takes it one extra step, leaving their orders to be Hold the line till death. The 3rd Brigade moves on to Hazen's left before Hazen actually wins his engagement. General Sheridan continues the assault, having his division capture rifle pits to Wood's right. He is mostly unopposed. Then the 14th Corps goes even further right, capturing the earthworks all the way to Chickamauga Creek. As it reaches night, the 28th Alabama finally falls back, even winning the day. Thomas's men begin digging in as artillery duels above their head. The actual casualties of Orchard Knob are hard to find out, with both sides ranging from 200 to 1100, but we do know that they're about equal. Bragg is shocked. Throughout the day he had heard reports of the battle, but did not do anything about it. But as he sees the Union fortifying the positions he once held, he is shaken out of his complacency. Grant is staring at him from his new headquarters at the top of that knob. He needs to reinforce his line. He urgently sends word to Claiborne to return, and then orders Major General Walker to take his division from Wilcat Mountain, move it to an area just south of Tunnel Hill, Tunnel Hill being the end of the Rebel line. This newfound sense of urgency caused by the loss of Orchard Knob leads Bragg to splitting his forces. For you see, you're supposed to put your troops on the highest ground you can. This would be the crest of the hill. But this actually doesn't work so well in practice, so instead there is a geographical position called a military crest, which works in practice. But Missionary Ridge is so jagged, the military crest doesn't function well. So instead Bragg used the foot of the mountain to place his line. This makes sense. What doesn't make sense is having no backup line further up the hill. Bragg finally orders the second lines to be built, but doesn't accompany this with reinforcements. Splitting the brigades between those at the foot of the mountain and those at the military crest. Even after all of this, Bragg still isn't putting in his full effort. The aftermath of Orchard Knob for the Union is much more coordinated. The main goal now is to transfer Sherman's four divisions over the Tennessee River so that they'll be able to assault Tunnel Hill. There's of course issues with this. First off, the bridge at Brown's Ferry takes serious damage as the rebels sent rest with explosives 
with, after many failures, succeeded right before General Osterhaus's division could cross it. Instead, Osterhaus is given to Hooker. In turn, Thomas transfers General Jefferson C. Davis to Sherman's command. Sherman is further reinforced by the 11th Corps moving to the north of the 4th Corps, allowing for the eventual crossing to link up with the rest of the Union line. Sherman also suffers from the fact that Tennessee River is flooded, disallowing two crossing points. While Sherman suffers, Hooker is happy. He has three divisions of seven brigades, giving him 12,000 men. Each division comes from a different section of the army. There is General Gary's 2nd Division of the 12th Corps, Ostras's 1st Division of the 15th Corps, and the 1st Division of the 15th Corps under General Charles Croft. Hooker has such strength, and he wants to use it. But all he gets from Grant is the opportunity to do a demonstration. When Thomas relays Grant's orders, he gives permission to take the mountain if the demonstration proves fruitful, just as Thomas himself did the day before. Grant just wants the Confederates to worry about Lookout Mountain, so they don't reinforce Missionary Ridge. But Hooker has another plan. He doesn't even bother to wait for the demonstration. He plans to take the hill. Opposing him are four brigades, Walton Moore's from Cheatham's division and P.S. and Brown's brigades from Stevenson's division. And these divisions are from the two different corps. Stevenson is technically in charge of Lookout Mountain, but you can already see the future command issues. P.S. and Brown are further south, while Walt Hill and Moore are north at Craven's house, the Rebel HQ. There are technically two more brigades, the remainder of Stevenson's division, but they are not at Lookout Mountain, instead covering the gap between it and Missionary Ridge. At 0300 hours, Hooker reinforced Gary, with General Walter Whitaker, half of Crust's division, and orders him to cross Lookout Creek and to assault Lookout Mountain, marching down the valley and sweeping every rebel from it. He believes this will force General Carter L. Stevenson to withdraw. This is just part of a larger plan with General Osterhaus, reinforced by Colonel Gross, the other half of Crest's division, to assault from a different angle and link up later. But don't get confused. This is primarily Gary's battle, which he is actually late for. He gets the orders at 0300 hours, but high water delayed him till 0830 meaning the sun was in the sky and part of Hooker's plan was surprise. But luckily, a new combatant joined. Fog begins to rise, hiding the rebels, allowing for Gary to take his three brigades and cross them by 1030 hours. He was on the western slope with Whitaker in reserve. Then Gary orders the advance, his vision slamming into Walt Hill's brigade. They quickly overrun the rebel skirmishers, who are forced to fall back to the 29th and 30th Mississippi, who are behind a stone wall. A strong fortification if assaulted directly, but it's facing perpendicular to the Union line, allowing for enfilading fire. <laughs> Rebels return volley, stunning the Union for about two seconds before being forced back. Some of these Mississippians rally with their brothers in the 24th and 27th, but those two regiments are also overran, despite faring slightly better. General Stevenson tries to support the fleeing men of Walltail with artillery and sharpshooters who do nothing but annoy the Federals. He sweeps over the bench and captures many rebels, as Walt Hill tries to rally his men at Craven's farmstead. It is at this moment Osterhaus appeared, having Colonel Gross duel with the 24th Mississippi, allowing for General Wood to encircle and capture the regiment. The men of Osterhaus then charge a picket line of rebel General Moore, capturing 225 Alabamians. This doesn't make Moore react, with him following orders not from Stevenson, but from the commander of Cheatham's division, General John K. Jackson, who is all the way back at Missionary Ridge. As at this point, Gary, exhausted, orders a consolidation of his gain. His men marched all night and fought all morning. It's noon. His men are hungry. Now is the time to rest, so they don't overextend themselves. The rebels realize this. The clouds block Hooker's view of them, meaning no artillery support for their opponent. Plus, Colonel David Ireland's brigade is exposed and it bore a majority of the Union's casualties. Moore and Walt Hill join together for a counterattack and charge at Ireland through the fog. Ireland, not knowing what he is facing, falls behind a low stone wall awaiting rebels who don't come. Moore instead takes his force and occupies a position between Ireland's brigade and Craven's house, awaiting a Union assault. One hour of pure anxiety. Whitaker's brigade was held in reserve by Gary for this battle, and is therefore energetic when it is ordered to assault. The men of Whitaker are joined by men of Gross and Wood. 
it's a rout of the rebels. Moore is flanked and joined his men in fleeing through the fog. Walt Hill took his 600 men and fled past Craven's house, where he met up with Petus, who finally reached the battlefield just in time to join the rout. Reports are sent back to Hooker and Grant when they receive orders. Hooker didn't want the later assaults, fearing a counterattack. Too late for them. At 1325, Hooker tells Grant, The conduct of the troops has been brilliant, and the success has far exceeded my expectations. At 1400 hours, Whitaker sends word to Hooker. I'm in possession of the White House, Craven's house, on Lookout Mountain. If I get ammunition, I can hold it. Then we are massing on my right. Grant tells the paranoid commander that a brigade is en route to help him, and ammunition is close by. The brigade won't get there till 1715 hours. Too late for battle, same as true for the ammunition. 1600 hours, Hooker claims victory, but refuses to follow up on it for the day is over. It is so dark in Chattanooga Valley that it is impossible for me to see the position of the enemy or its numbers, and even very imprudent to descend into it tonight. I load the line from the White House to the point where the railroad passes beneath the mountain down the river on the Chattanooga side. Bragg sent a brigade to rescue those still on the mountain at 0200 hours on the 25th. The Confederates retreat and move to their final position, Missionary Ridge. Under the light of the moon, the American flag is planted on the summit of Lookout Mountain. Allow me to add the situation so far. In the last two days, Grant's subordinates went beyond his orders to push the Confederates from their defensive positions to their final line at Missionary Ridge. General Sherman is just north of Tunnel Hill with five divisions against Claiborne's single division. He has occupied Billy Goat Hill and is in prime position to strike the rebel flanks. Bragg is worried. He has only 36,000 men to defend his position, his 8,000 to 12,000, cavalrymen being too far away to join the battle, and Grant can bring around 60,000 men to bear against him. He wants to fall back and close a council with his two corps commanders. Hardy also wishes to fall back, but Breckenridge, who is more wasted than I knew possible, argues that if Missionary Ridge can't be defended, nowhere can. Bragg is, for some reason, won over by Breckenridge. Grant, after the 24th, realizes he's in a better position than hoped for. He has mastery of the battlefield, and he can use Thomas and Hooker in the assault. Truman will do what he was always planned to do, strike Tunnel Hill and roll up the Confederate right flank. But new orders are given to the other two army commanders. Hooker is to cross the Roseville Gap, and from there, strike north and take the Confederate left flank. Thomas is to execute a frontal assault, just enough to keep pressure on the rebel center. An inglorious task. Truman receives orders to begin the assault just after sun breaks the night sky, and just as the first glimpse of sunshine reaches the general's eye, three brigades are sent forward against Tunnel Hill. They achieve some success taking the northernmost knob, but are soon stalled. Sherman had made two blunders, only using three brigades. Though this is understandable given the narrow pass. But what isn't understandable is his second mistake of not using his other brigades to do anything. Sherman reached the second line of the rebels and can't press further. Howard takes his two divisions and slams them against Stevenson and Walker, where he is also stalled. Though this does delay reinforcements to Claiborne's division, saving Sherman from counterattack. Hooker isn't doing much better. He began his assault late, with his men not beginning their march till 10 hundred hours. And despite facing no opposition, they move slowly and sloppily. They are further delayed by bridge building. Grant is watching all this unfold from Orchard Knob. Truman has five divisions, 21,000 men, and is making little progress. He needs someone's help. Grant doesn't trust Hooker. He took hours to move two miles. Instead, Ulysses goes to a former classmate of his, General Wood. After conversing, turns to Thomas and tells his men to get ready for another parade. The Confederates would surely stop reinforcing Claiborne if they believed another assault would be had. Grant, in fact, wants another assault. The rifle pits at the base of the ridge will be taken. Thomas disagrees, but at 1500 hours, he receives order from an angry commander. He passes on to General Granger, who has to be reminded to take a break from directing artillery fire to form his two divisions up. On the far left is the 3rd Division of the 14th Corps, under Brigadier General Bayard. To his right was the 3rd Division of the 4th Corps, under Brigadier General Wood. On his right is Sheridan's 2nd Division of the 4th Corps. And lastly is Johnson's 1st Division of the 14th Corps. In total, 24,000 men. The signal cannon is fired before the full orders can be passed down. Some of General August Woach's officers come to him to ask where to stop the assault. 
I don't know what hell I expect. These words come to define the assault. Sheridan sends word to Granger for further instructions, but his men are advanced before Granger even gets the message. The 14,000 rebels defending the rifle pits were forced to watch a sea of blue come cascading towards them. No common order is given to the southern regiments holding the base. Some are told to hold against the odds, others to fire a volley and then retreat. This disorder dooms the defense, and soon the Union tide is upon them. The 100 Confederate cannons that dawn on the ridge provide little support and are forced to cease fire once the combat turns to close range. The yelling of Chickamauga, Chickamauga is heard from the victorious Bluecoats. But as the rebels fled their rifle pits, the cannons could start again, zero in on the Union, along with those rebel riflemen at the crest of the ridge. I'm willing to fall back. I'm unable to stay put and get picked off. The individual regiments begin to scale the mountain. General Willich ordered his Horn Brigade to make the ascent, but only after his regimental commanders did so. When General Wood arrives on the scene, he gives an order for all men of his division to begin to climb. Grant is viewing this from his knob and turns to Granger and Thomas and demands to know who gave the order to advance. Both answer honestly that they hadn't. Granger adds, When those fellows get started, all hell can't stop them. Granger gives retroactive permission to Wood for the assault on the ridge, but other generals get conflicting orders. There is chaos. But as the commanders on the ground realize that retreat is against their best interests, they order their brigades up. General Churchin orders his men to charge, and with Woolwich, they begin a steady advance to turn a rebel flank, the middle. Churchin turns in with the rest of his division, while Woolwich is soon joined by men of Hazen's brigade, and he breaks the rebel line in the center. Colonel Tucker, a rebel, flees in the face of Woolwich, and soon the Union regiments of Hazen turn on the rebel flanks. Bragg has no reserves, so the only people who can stop Willich are those already engaged in the battle. As the rebels try to organize a counterattack, other regiments of the Union have reached the ridge. Hazen attacks south and Willich north, and soon the rebel line folds, not from the flanks, but the inside. Hooker from the south soon joins the battle, and is at that point the rebels break and run. Only Claiborne at the north can make a clean escape. Bragg lost, and Grant won. The rebels left 361 dead comrades on the field, 2,160 wounded, and 4,146 captured or missing. The Union lost 753 killed, 4,713 wounded, and 350 missing. Let's not forget what the Confederates left behind that weren't people. 42 cannons, 69 artillery caissons and carriages, and 7,000 small arms. These losses are small compared to bigger battles, but nonetheless, a chaplain asked the Virginian Thomas what to do with the bodies. Mix them up. I'm tired of states' rights. The short November day saved Bragg, with only Sheridan trying to pursue the rebels in the dark. He did capture Confederate wagons and a further 250 men, but the real success of the operation was driving a wedge between Bragg and Longstreet. It isn't until the morning of the 26th that the pursuit of Bragg really begins. Grant wants to destroy Bragg, while also supporting Burnside, so he further splits his force. General Granger is to take the 4th Corps and march to Burnside's aid. The rest of his force will pursue Bragg. And that's where the week ends. Grant has broken the siege of Chattanooga, won three distinct battles all by the way of assault, uphill against entrenched foes, and won a strong victory. But Bragg still remains. I want to explain my confusion with this battle. I have three main sources on this battle, and each broke the battle into three sections, and all three weren't explained in detail. You'll notice this report is much shorter than the Chickamauga one. This campaign isn't over yet with the pursuit of Bragg, but it feels like there should be more information on this battle. I suspect, since so much of this battle relied on Thomas, a man who is against his own promotion in the papers, that we weren't given the best picture. Nevertheless, we won, and we are perfectly set up to keep on winning, which should happen next week. Hello, it's the entire Civil Week by Week team here, and I would just like to thank everyone for watching. This video came out during a tough period of school, but I'm glad to go through it. I want you guys to know that even though I'm in college, this channel will continue. I've had a great time throughout my high school career, now college career, reporting to you on the Civil War each week. And I hope to see you again next week.